Hi, everyone. <laughs> I'm Omar from Microsoft. So this is a different kind of presentation that you guys are typically used to. So it won't be entirely Linux-based. It'll be more tailored around what we do in Windows on the host. And our Linux focus is really running Linux as a guest. So this is our agenda. It's simple. How do we use RDMA? Where do we use RDMA? Some of the internals for how we configure it, manage it some of the challenges that we've run into, and what are we doing in the future, specifically around secure multi-tenancy. So in Windows, uh, we don't use OFS. We effectively have a layer called ND, Network Direct. There's two components within that. One's user space, one's kernel space. The first one we're showing here is the kernel space component, also known as NDKPI, or Network Direct Kernel Provider Interface. The way this is built is agnostic to the fabric type. So it's really baseline on the common set of verb operations that you'd have in IB, IWARP, and Rocky. If something like OPA wanted to support this, they'd also have to baseline on the same uh, set of APIs. Its real value is really defining what the API is. Structure definitions, uh, you know, function definitions, or, or, or signatures, and you know, all, all the likes. Now, <laughs> one, one big difference between the way that uh, Linux and Windows consume RDMA is that in Windows, that OFS min layer, all that control logic that's in the kernel for Linux, isn't in the kernel for Windows. It's really inside of the IHV's device driver. So that has some benefits and some cons. You know, the benefit, of, of course, is if there's an issue there, you know, they, can, they have more flexibility as to how they make the change or support new features. And the con, of course, is if I have multiple NICs across the ecosystem, they've each got their own implementation in there. Now, we have to validate all this. We have to get it to work. For you to get a device driver to work on Windows, it has to be signed and certified. And to do that, an RDMA driver would have to basically get past our HLK validation vehicle, which effectively does a lot of sanitization verification for the functional operations for RDMA, and that in combination with all of the other accelerations that may be residing on that NIC. And our PCS solution, which is a private cloud stress. And what it basically does is after you've passed this functional test, you basically run through a four or eight node uh, stamp setup, a cluster. And that's doing live migrations all over the place. Live migrations like crazy. It's injecting all kinds of crazy traffic patterns at full extreme load. It's, it's, it's stressing storage, it's stressing networking, it's stressing compute. Everything gets stressed at the same time. And it's also doing fault injection at the same time. So if your device driver stands up to that stress, then you know what? Thumbs up. You get a signature, you get certified, and your driver can be included in Windows. Now, for user space, it's a different solution, it's NDSPI. So Network Direct Service Provider Interface. And in this case, one of the things you'll notice right away is that the big difference from this and your standard Linux model is in Linux, your kernel verbs are basically a superset of your user space verbs, right? You do something in user space, it comes down into the kernel for control path, sets everything up, passes your context, you do your stuff, so you've got this common layer in kernel space that can serve kernel verb consumers and is acting as a control path for user space verb consumers. In Windows, it's a little different. It's actually a separate proxy driver. So what you end up with is you end up with a device driver that has a kernel entry point for kernel space verb consumers and a completely separate entry point for user space consumers. This is for historical reasons. And of course, there's a smaller uh, range of IHVs that support the NDSPI interface. It's something that we'd like to improve, but given that that interface is slightly HPC MPI focused, then the general applicability of IHVs writing drivers for this becomes less. So where do we use RDMA? So for this talk, I'm going to focus on our private cloud utilization. I can speak about public cloud, but we can discuss some of that offline because I, I don't exactly work in the uh, public cloud space. The solutions that we design, develop, and deliver are actually a lot of the solutions that power Azure, the public cloud, but they have very specific niche use cases for the way RDMA is used. Whereas in the private cloud space, we're more biased towards hyperconverged environments and general RDMA usage, mostly for uh, SMB Direct. So if we go back in time, we look at 
disaggregate storage. So back in the day, it would be a over-provisioned fiber channel fabric, right? And in over-provisioned fabric, it's fairly easy to get things to work. So we would deploy RDMA on that over-provisioned fabric, and you know what? It just works, regardless of Rocky or iWarp. However, when we get into the hyperconverged space, now that fabric is shared. Now I have VMs, and those VMs are injecting traffic on the same fabric. They're separate from the RDMA traffic. They can be noisy. They can try to push the RDMA traffic out of the way. And it really comes down to how you configure your fabric for it to work correctly. So you end up needing uh, PFC and ETS from DCB. So VLANs, of course, everybody uses VLANs in, in private cloud. Uh, PFC is an absolute requirement to be able to deploy Rocky. Our focus is really is Rocky V2. For iWarp, uh, you'll need it at some point. If you reach a certain scale, you will have to implement some form of PFC or ETS. And marketing slide, it's all Windows Server 2016. Now, I just spoke to how we deploy or how we use or we consume RDMA in Windows Server, but we also have RDMA end-to-end -end all the way to clients. So in this slide, I've got a collection of Windows 10 clients and a collection of Windows servers. And previous versions of Windows servers would basically have RDMA capabilities from back end to the middle layer. But in Windows Server 2016 and with Windows 10 clients, we can actually have a workstation acting as a client for end-to-end -end RDMA. Obviously, this comes down to how you configure your fabric. And that makes really happy users. I mean, when you get great storage performance on your workstations, users are very happy, especially the folks in media, financials, oil and gas. Some of the internals. <clears throat> so we support three, three different uh, configuration topologies for RDMA. The first is obviously the bare metal case, right? It's you, you slap a NIC onto a system and you get RDMA functionality, great. The second one is, the second and third ones are, are the actual focus, is when we start virtualizing that host. We start putting a collection of VMs or containers on that host. So how do we consume RDMA in that case? So in the middle case, in mode two, uh, we effectively expose RDMA to the trusted environment, which is the host, uh, and you do a mapping of a virtual NIC, which requires a function pointer table exchange through ND with the underlying mini port, and he can consume RDMA through and DKPI, just fine. Uh, the primary user there is, of course, SMB, SMB Direct. <clears throat> now, I can have any collection of virtual NICs on this vSwitch. Uh, and what we typically do is we map the virtual NIC that's doing RDMA one-to-one -to, -one to the physical NIC. So if we have, let's say, a team that I'll discuss in the future, uh, you would have one-to-one -one mapping. But you can also have end-to-one -one mappings. And we've tested up to 16-ish virtual functions per physical port. I'm sorry, not virtual functions, uh, a virtual NICs per physical port doing RDMA, and what we see is that it holds up fairly well, but your fairness starts to break down at some point. Uh, also, density comes into the picture. It really comes down to how many V ports you have on your NIC switch inside of your NIC to be able to support uh, high density there. The third case, which is the, the, the more interesting of the bunch, is the case where we start giving virtual functions to guests. And in that case, today, we can expose those RDMA-capable virtual functions to the guests uh, now, there are some obvious caveats. I'm bypassing the host, so it's got to be trusted. It's got to be a trusted workload, so it would be an infrastructure VM or something that the administrator completely controls. It's not something you, you download from the web or some tenant that just, you just placed on there. You trust him not to mess with your fabric. Okay? Now, I'll point out one major difference here between uh, the way that uh, synthetic NICs and guests uh, work between the Linux and Windows is in that in Windows, you always have this device called the NetVSC. And think of it as the, the synthetic NIC. And a virtual function is always an optional acceleration to that. It can be dynamically added and removed for X, Y, Z reasons. Say I have very high density and I've prioritized those virtual functions between guests. Well, those virtual functions can be removed and given to another guest or added to this guest when this guest needs it. And it should mostly be non-disruptive. So that holds true for the Ethernet case because you have a synthetic path for Ethernet because it's kernel mediated IO and your states are really inside of you know, your, your stack, inside of the guest. Not so much for RDMA, right? Because it's not like I have a software fallback path for RDMA. Now, in theory, you could implement something like uh, Scythe Diwarp or Soft Rocky, but that's not something that we're currently looking at right now. Our 
stance is that the verb consumer has to be multi-protocol aware. So our current uh, gamut of verb consumers are multi-protocol aware. If I remove a virtual function that's doing RDMA, it'll just fall back to TCP IP and continue operating. And I'll discuss more about this trusted stuff in later slides. <clears throat> so this is a, a typical mass stamp, Microsoft Azure stack. This is what the system looks like. And the internals of the system uh, is effectively one NIC dual port, obvious single point of failure, but the OEM is free to configure two NICs if that becomes an issue. And we team those two NICs together. And teaming becomes an issue in RDMA for, for, for reasons I'll, I'll get to in a second. So the way we do this is we have a dynamic distribution. So we can take the egress traffic going out to the fabric and we can spray it on both links, but the incoming traffic to any endpoint can only come in on one link. And RDMA works just fine in this configuration. Now, obviously to send the traffic out, I'm having to parse that traffic in software for the, this is not the RDMA traffic by the way, this is just for tenant traffic. I'm having to parse that traffic and that has CPU costs. So even though I get aggregate send bandwidth, I am raising my CPU cost by doing that. A more performance solution where you have very high speed NICs, so think anything above 10 gigs, 40 gigs, 50 gigs. It's basically not to do any parsing of the traffic, just have very high density in terms of VMs and allow all of them operating in aggregate to make use of those links. And in this case also, RDMA works just fine, no issues at all. However, this does not work at all. A switch doing LACP is gonna be looking at four or five tuple traffic spreading. And he's certainly not looking at the MPA markers or DDP headers inside of iWarp or BTH encapsulated UDP over Rocky. Uh, and if it did, there'd be some very complex configurations. So in that case, we really can't have the switch doing this distribution for us. Now, I mentioned earlier that we are heavy users of the V ports on the VEB or NIC switch. And the way we configure it is we say traffic class three is for RDMA usage, and we typically split it 50-50, so we program ETS on every link and every hop. All tenant traffic runs on traffic class zero. Now, all of those limitations were specific to running Ethernet. However, I can use SMB multi-channel with RDMA or SMB direct. And SMB will make full usage of those links. And it operates in a mode very similar to that Hyper-V port mode that I described earlier. In aggregate at high density, it'll make use of both links for ingress and egress. SMB multi-channel will load balance their traffic across those two links. It's effectively verb level teaming. If you can do verb level teaming, then this problem with LACP kind of goes away. Does it, does it, uh, I, I just say, the, the traffic spreading problem gets solved, the LAC problem, the LACP problem does not. A switch cannot be an active participant in that spreading. And that also makes very happy users. What are some of the challenges that we're seeing? So I mentioned earlier that our, our, my, my focus here really is uh, private cloud deployments. And what we see is LACP can become a blocker. Um, network admins and host admins are really siloed playing the same game and contending. Your network admin is gonna deploy appliances, he's gonna put LACP all over the place. He's looking at VLANs, uh, you know, class of service. Your server admin uh, is responsible for software-defined networking, software-defined storage. He's actually got a network inside of the box that he's gotta configure correctly and make sure that that network interoperates with the fabric outside. That's complex. So these are some proposals. They may sound simplistic, but we would like to find a way and work with the general Linux community to figure out how we can get LACP and RDMA to coexist. This problem's been around for, for quite a long time and no solutions really come up. So one could assume that, hey, if I have a VEB on a per physical port basis, is there a way that I could use some sort of a crossbar concept to reroute the traffic from one VEB to the other? So take the case of my Linux VM on the left-hand side. If the switch was doing LACP, the traffic would arrive on the right-hand side. Well, that's just gonna get dropped. So is there any way to redirect the traffic to the right VEB so that it arrives at the right VF? The crossbar concept, maybe something like this can be used. And my theory here is, if you can double the PCI, if your PCI bandwidth would be 
double or more of your total sum of physical link bandwidth, then something like this should be possible. It'd be a very noisy PCI interface, no doubt, but it should have interoperability with LACP and RDMA. So is this a viable solution? For those of you here that are IHVs, I mean, I'm more than happy to talk about this offline with you guys, but we would like to find a solution here. Oh, I'm sorry, this, this is another option. This is a, uh, basically I have, you offload LACP or ECMP to the physical NIC. And in this case, different from prior slide, in this case, the switch sees a single NIC and you would only be notified of link state changes or link loss whenever you've lost all physical links. And there's some benefits to that. It's simple from a host point of view, but it's also complex from a physical NIC point of view. It's yet another large piece of logic that gets offloaded to the device. And that has to go through the full validation management cycle with HOK and PCS, and PCS that I mentioned earlier. So tell me if this sounds familiar. RDMA fabric gets deployed and it doesn't work. And then the investigation starts. And it's a countless number of questions around VLANs, ECN, DCB, PFC, ETS. Now, like I said before, this is very private cloud focused. So we don't have networking experts that are deploying these systems. We have general administrators that are trying to deploy these systems on premise. So think Azure in my closet, but without the Azure army to configure my systems. So it needs to be turnkey. Most of our experience comes down to this. This is where we see customers struggling quite a bit. This is complexity that's in the customer's hands that they have to deal with. They have effectively have to take every single hop on their fabric and configure the appropriate PFC trigger. They've got to go to their Tor, their vendor, figure out what command line interface they have, figure out what buffering model they have, configure that buffering model correctly. And if they're doing multi-hop, they've got to also add an ECN trigger, right? And then you have to combine that with any host-based ETS reservations that you might have. That's complex. There's just no other way around it. So this is what they see. And this becomes a cost. This comes in as support calls to us. This comes in as support calls to the IHVs and support calls to the OEMs. So what we want is something that's turnkey. We want something simple. Simple for the average user. So what can we do? There's got to be something. I know there's a Rocky Consortium website. It's got a lot of great, lot of great information. And some of the IHVs are building tools around this space to make this simpler. That's, that's awesome. That's all great. And some of those tools are actually coming to Windows, which we're excited about. Uh, but for right now, the, our pain point right now really is that complexity in the administrators and the user's hands. Another issue that comes up is inc inconsistent tours. I mentioned earlier that all of these tours have their own CLIs. And, and it's kind of frustrating because they're all running the same merchant silicon. They're all running the same chips. They just bolt on their different firmware, their different UI, but they don't expose the same capabilities up. Classic example, uh, PFC supports on priority tag traffic, traffic class zero, inconsistently supported across the ecosystem. I mean, per the spec, that should just work, but it doesn't. Simple things that administrators can do. These are very simple. Collection of ICMP, TCP, RDMA ping tools. Those exist in Linux, not so much in Windows, we have to build those. We'd love to work with the Linux community on having common tools that work across our platforms for this. Other things, so verb consumers start to come online. The quality of the verb consumers that you have may differ. They may have built, you know, very tailored to high performance, uh, or they may be very biased towards serviceability. The thing is that the, the two things stand on opposite ends of the software architecture spectrum, right? If you're going for diagnosability, serviceability, you're probably not getting all that great performance and vice versa. So one of the things that we'll be doing is we'll be adding the ability to intercept all errors because we have this ND layer that can see, it's basically a function pointer table redirection. Uh, we'll be logging all RDMA errors. So if I have a verb consumer that is misbehaving and doesn't have sufficient self-contained diagnosis, we can at least correlate any issues that might be happening to the things that we see on the path. And this would apply to all error paths and control paths. Obviously those are the easy parts because once you do that, all performance bets are out the window. And validation tools. Uh, what we see is uh, <laughs> uh, 
customers are skipping basic validation steps, right? If you deploy an RDMA fabric, did you ensure that you know, your priorities were set correctly? Did you actually do a test to see if unbound UDP would push your RDMA traffic out of the way? And what we see is they actually don't do that step. So it's, it's a gap. It's, it's a best practice deployment gap that needs to be addressed. And they're also not doing uh, in-cast testing. So they may have done a simple ping, simple TCP IP, RDMA transfer between any two endpoints, but maybe they didn't do in-cast testing, and then they deployed. And then at a certain stress level, it starts to fall apart. Lastly, this last one here is RDMA counter correlation. So in Windows, there's a ridiculous amount of system counters. And what we see sometimes is there'll be an RDMA error that happens. The connection falls apart or some, something happens. When we go look at that, it's really up to the subject matter experts that's first in networking or RDMA to take a look at the problem. And he's going to look at the things that he knows about. The things that he doesn't know about, he's not going to be looking at. So one of the things we're looking at is, can we find some way to do time series counters across the system, across all counters, such that if there were an RDMA error, we can try to correlate that error to something else that might have happened in the system that could have been the trigger. Maybe this RDMA error isn't exactly an RDMA error. It's a cascading error for something else. So we tend to see these things in, in, in storage. We've seen them a few times. So this is another initiative we're sort of embarking on. Now, is that something that's common between Linux and Windows? I'd say yes, maybe this is another area we can, we can collaborate. In the end, this is what we need. It just needs to be easy. Administrators want this to be easy. The complexity shouldn't be in the administrator's hands. He just needs to be able to roll the box into his closet and say, I've got a cloud in my closet. Now, future work. For multi-tenancy, it's a classical Coke versus Pepsi problem. Coke shouldn't be Pepsi, Pepsi shouldn't see Coke, neither should be able to damage each other. And obviously, if we give out a virtual function, we're bypassing the host and all the security that that brings along. So how do we secure our tenants? And this is applicable to both Azure and private cloud. Well, number one is we have to be able to control what the tenant places on the fabric. Always assume malicious tenants. Always assume security. Anything placed on the fabric must be sanitized and parsed. Let's say I have a tenant that is saying, hey, I'm using RDMA on traffic class three, but I'm actually putting all kinds of crazy UDP stuff on there, not RDMA traffic. Can we prevent that? Well, yes, we should. And we can do that through a language that we have at Microsoft called GFT, which basically is a, it defines a, a spec, an API layer, that tells the underlying devices how to sanitize the traffic. Um, it also does, uh, think of it as encapsulations. So think VXLAN, MBGRE encapsulations, or any, any header type encapsulation at that. And full traffic parsing, transpositions, and modifications. The second part of controlling what gets placed on the fabric is tenant DCP. So again, like in, the, like in the example I gave, if you're using the wrong traffic class, then we should find a way to prevent that. So we can do automatic DCB configuration on behalf of a tenant. And this is actually very applicable to private cloud, not so much public cloud. In the public cloud space, uh, they tend not to use uh, L2 constructs or capabilities exposed to guests. It's really all based off of L3 networks. So in this case, if a guest uses the wrong traffic class, then we can auto-correct that for him. And in fact, we can go all the way to the extreme to say, you know what, you don't have to configure DCB at all. We'll take care of all of it under the covers because we can tell what the traffic type is at configuration provisioning time. The second major thing to control is how much a tenant places on the fabric. So you don't want somebody being too noisy, pushing everybody else out of the way. So you need some sort of rate limiters. So this comes down to you know, send reservations, send caps, receive caps. We'd love to do receive reservations, but that's a very hard problem to solve. Uh, it's something that we'd like to work with the community on also. And lastly, controlling how many resources the tenant consumes. So if I have multiple virtual functions, one of the virtual functions is malicious and decides to drain all memory regions, that's kind of a problem. Or somebody else decides to use all queue pairs, also a problem. Most of these, by the way, 
are solved by current generation NICs. As in the hardware and the drivers support this, it's really just a matter of building the, the, the host infrastructure, the, the, the controls. It's a matter of building those into the platform to actually leverage it. And these are the great partners that we work with. They've done some amazing work on Windows. We co-engineer with these folks on a daily basis. For those of you here, thank you. Thank you very much for the work that we've done together. And with that, see my presentation. Thank you. Sure. We're hiring. Blatant self-promotion. I apologize. I have to do it. Yes. Uh, happy customers, and you had a picture of a Windows client with RDMA to a Windows server. How does it work on a hybrid, you know, on-prem client with a server in the cloud? So that slide is specific to having an on-prem infrastructure, not so much a cloud. Like if could you, mix? you, you could, but I would. I would posit that in doing that, you actually lose a lot of the benefits that RDMA gave you. I mean, you're introducing very significant latencies into your, your, your communication, and the real savings really comes down to CPU savings from the protocol efficiency. Uh, is that acceptable? I don't know. You may, you may be better off with TCP in that case. And if the interest is really a, a low-cost, fast connection setup and the like, then you're better off with something like Quick. Um, I've been <clears throat> involved with the uh, Windows side of the RDMA world for a while. Um, years ago, you guys, in addition to like the Network Direct, used to have something called Winsock Direct. Uh, do you still have something like that for people that want to use RDMA in a sockets-like interface, SDP or Winsock Direct? So I know SDP is no longer supported. Right. Windsock Direct proper. I'm sorry to say that that was before my time. I, okay. I can't comment on that. We can. It was kind of the predecessor of, of SDP. Uh, yes. But you don't, you don't have any plans to do anything similar to like that in the future? Or? Uh, there's no plans right now. Mm -hmm. Although there are some interesting protocols like um, uh, SMCR seems interesting. Uh, and... Um, I forget the other one, I'm sorry, the, the user space uh, sockets. Uh, well, in, in no. Linux, there's something called R sockets. Yes, R sockets, yes. yes. That's also interesting to us. So. Okay, well, yeah, maybe we should talk yes. offline. Yeah, thanks. Hi. Hi. A few comments. So, regarding the um, hash, you mentioned about uh, Rocky and using the BTH or something like that. So just to remind you that we are uh, using the uh, external uh, encapsulation UDP header source port to use it for entropy. So we basically push a hash into the source uh, UDP port of the inner headers. So you can use it for LACP or ECMP. The other comment is that we do have support for, we are working on support for LACP and ECMP configuration for RDMA for Linux. So we can work together to see how it uh, embeds to Windows, but it's already in works. And to the question about WSD, so WSD is not supported in Windows anymore, and the difference between WSD and SDP is that SDP stack was implemented in kernel, and WSD was all in user mode, and as said, it's not supported. Right. Thanks. Great, thank you. <laughs>